Now I have neither happiness nor unhappiness. Everything passes. That is the one and only thing that I have thought resembled a truth in the society of human beings, where I have dwelled up to now as in a burning hell. Everything passes. This is a quote from the fictional novel No Longer Human by Osamu Dazai, Alienation, Self-Inflicted Suffering, and the Woes of Living. All themes present in No Longer Human and on Osamu's second novel, The Flowers of Buffoonery. Today we will be discussing the deeper themes and storyline of Osamu Dazai's literary works. Oba Yozo is our protagonist and her story takes place in a pre-war Japan in the 20th century. The story of No Longer Human is told through notebooks written by Yozo, a very troubled man who feels intense alienation from society and his peers and has an inability to reveal his true self to others. Yozo himself comments on this saying, I have always shook with fright before human beings. Unable as I was to feel the least particle of confidence in my ability to speak and act like a human being, I kept my solitary agonies locked in my breast. I kept my melancholy and agitation hidden, careful lest any trace should be exposed. I feigned an innocent optimism. I gradually perfected myself in the role of the partial eccentric. If we were to assign him an archetype, the best fitting one would be the jester. The archetype jester entails being a clown, comedian, and fool, or trickster. And this is definition of jester is established very on in Osamu's narrative in Yozo's retelling of his childhood. As the title may imply, the flowers of buffoonery is just that, one of Yozo's antics. But I'm getting too ahead of myself, so let's go back to Yozo's story. Yozo's notebooks are referred to as memorandums, and the book has a total of three, the third one having part one and part two. In the first memorandum, we are introduced to Yozo's feelings of alienation and otherness, this being fueled by his inability to understand the people around him. He described the people he lives with as egotistic and of bad faith, and in an attempt to gain their attention or understand them, Yozo begins to act strange and silly, playing the role of the court jester or the class clown. It's important to note that Yozo had been sexually abused in his childhood by the servants in his household, which very likely played a large part in his psychology going on. Quoting Yozo, I have frantically played the clown in order to distangle myself from these painful relationships, only to wear myself out as a result. The second memorandum shows Yozo becoming anxious over the fact that someone may be onto him and expose his false buffoonery. This anxiety is only heightened by his classmate Takechi, who sees through his facade. Yozo, absolutely terrified that Takechi might reveal his secret, decides to befriend him to keep him from revealing his secret to anyone else. Takechi and Yozo grow closer over ghostly paintings, where Yozo comes to realize that artists can express their inner truth through art and their own trauma. Once discovering this, Yozo goes to paint a self-portrait inspired by such artists, which he dubs as dreadful. So dreadful, in fact, that he doesn't dare reveal his portrait to anyone but Takechi. Later on in this memorandum, it's revealed that Takechi was driven to suicide after getting rejected by Yozo's sister. Yozo has lied to Takechi about his sister being interested in him, and this becomes the first major death Yozo has had a hand in. The story then fast forward a bit to Yozo graduating proceeding to study art in a university, where he ultimately neglects his studies after meeting a sleazy man named Horiki. Horiki's bad habits bleed onto Yozo where he descends into a callous cycle of drinking, smoking, and adultery. This adultery results in him meeting a bartender named Tsuneko, a young woman who pays for Yozo's drink and eventually commits a double suicide with him. Yozo describes her as the first woman he's ever loved, saying, I drank the liquor. She did not intimidate me and I felt no obligation to perform my clownish antics for her. I drank in silence, not bothered to hide the taciturnity and gloominess which were my true nature. Yozo ends up surviving, but Tsuneko's death succeeded. Yozo feels an immense guilt over her death, making this the second major death he was involved with. And because Yozo is not a criminal, he is sent to a prison and eventually an asylum. This is where Osamu's second book comes into play, The Flowers of Buffoonery. The Flowers of Buffoonery is an interesting novella, because much of the book contains comments from the author rather than a full story. Osamu claims that this novel was made to save the character of Oba Yozo, and this is where we can really begin to dissect the literary argument and rhetorical devices being used in Osamu's novels. If it wasn't obvious at first, the more you read, the clearer the argument becomes. This is what feeling detached and alienated from society feels like. Yozo feels so utterly different than everyone around him, finding himself unable to comprehend humanity. This novel explores the human condition and the sorrows that come from life. That's not to say that Yozo didn't deserve all the grief and sorrow, but his suffering is so great and explained in such a way that you can't help but pity him. Quoting no longer human, mine has been much a love a life of shame. I can't even guess myself what it must be to live the life of a human being. Now before we can dissect the literary choices and devices Osamo uses, we should probably finish the story first. In the third memorandum, part one, Oba is expelled from university and has brought great shame to his family through a suicide attempt, which made headlines and made Yozo's father, a congressman, look bad. Oba is then sent to live with a family friend whom he calls Fishface or Flatfish. Yozo finds himself in love with another woman, a single mom, and he attempts to assimilate back into society and be a father to his lover's child. Yozo, as you can probably assume, once again reverts to his old ways of drinking, adultery, and smoking. 
On one of these alcohol runs at the bar, Yozo meets a young woman named Yoshiko who wants him to stop drinking. Yoshiko, even though innocent and naive, has a very positive influence on Yozo. In the second part of the third memorandum, Yoshiko and Yozo have started living a very happy life, where Yozo quits drinking and finds a job as a cartoonist. Yozo and Yoshiko are happy, and Yozo's creative dreadful paintings depict him and Yoshiko's children, and this alludes to Yozo's happy outlook on life. However, unfortunately for Yozo, Horiki shows up in Yozo's life once more, and Yozo finds himself going back to his old destructive habits. Yoshiko, ever the faithful and loving wife, leads into Yozo's addiction, minus the adultery which she is unaware of. Once Yozo and Horiki are out drinking, Yozo discovers his wife being sexually assaulted by his cartoon publicist, and this sends him spiraling into heavy drinking and eventually morphine. Yoshiko meets a pharmacist who gives him morphine, whom he cheats on with Yoshiko with, which drives Yoshiko to becoming frantic and paranoid. Because Yozo continued to be unfaithful to her, Yoshiko commits suicide. Yoshiko's death brings such despair onto Yozo that he is admitted to a mental institution, and after his release, he lives the end of his days in isolation, commenting on his bitter despair. The book's ending has no resolution, and throughout the novel, our protagonist Yozo is seemingly struck down again and again, over and over. As depressing as this book is, its beauty is within the rhetorical devices the author uses to communicate a certain feeling. Comparisons are metaphors, outside allusions, personifications, and most importantly, narration. Our narrator no longer human is exclusively Yozo, but in the flowers of a funerary, Yozo and Osamu are both speaking. The contrast between Osamu's comments and Yozo's thoughts in the flowers of a funerary give us insight on both the writer and the character, which are now almost impossible to separate. The most known allusion made a no longer human is a reference to Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, where Yozo and Horiki comment on the antonym of crime, and how Dostoevsky uses crime and punishment not as synonyms, but antonyms. Personification is used when Yozo describes his pain and sorrows as the people who brought them to him, even if they aren't alive or in his present. Metaphors are also very commonly used to communicate a certain feeling or point, such as the weak fear happiness itself. They can harm themselves with cotton wool, sometimes they are even wounded by happiness, and love flies out the window when poverty comes in the door, they say, and it's true. Obviously, love cannot fly, and you cannot hurt yourself on cotton wool, but the metaphor being made illustrates Osamu's point poetically and gracefully, even if the subject is dark. No longer human in the flowers of buffoonery is a wonderful piece of work by the author Osamu Budasai, and the theme is more relatable than one might assume. You may feel assimilated, not outcast by society, but Osamu brings out those deep, innermost feelings about society, and without a doubt, you have most likely felt.